I'd like to introduce you to our facilitator, who is our own Bill Fincer. Hi, Bill. Hi. A senior scientist at the Concord Consortium, and he'll be sharing with us a CODAP workshop, which is from the basics to the secrets. I'm very intrigued. Um, so Bill Spencer's work has long centered on getting students using data in every subject that they study. He's been a classroom teacher, a curriculum developer, a teacher in professional development course, designer and leader, and education software developer as well. And Bill works with staff of many projects, both inside and outside the Concord Consortium, to help them make use of CODAP. We're very lucky to have a hands-on workshop with him today, and Bill's going to explain what that means in just a minute. A recorded version of this webinar will be made available on YouTube, and we will email you details about it through Eventbrite after the event. If you are comfortable sharing your name and face, please turn on your web camera during the webinar event so that we can see you. I'd also like to emphasize that the format of this webinar is participatory by design. This means that we'll be working together to decide the conversations, the connections, and activities that we want to discuss. I'll facilitate the live questions that you have, and I'll also be fielding the text-based questions on on Zoom chat. For those of you just joining us, welcome to our webinar. Our speaker today is Bill Finzer, who will be speaking about a Kodak workshop. Bill, I'll let you take it from here. All right. And I'm going to go into gallery view so I can see as many of you as possible. Um, so this is going to be a, an adventure for all of us. Um, I. I do give a lot of presentations at, for which CODAP is an important part, but usually those presentations are about something else, about data science education, or about um, census at school, um, different, different subjects, and CODAP plays the role of um, illustration for, for the presentation. So in thinking about this webinar, I thought, I'm gonna do something different. Uh, the thing I really know about is this piece of software, not that other stuff. So um, this is gonna be a, a, a talk that um, is less deep than we might like, but hopefully it will be fun for all of us. Um, there is a um, slide deck that we're going to make use of, and there's a poll that I'd like you to take. And the poll, I'm going to chat it uh, so that you can start it whenever you like. Um, so in the Zoom chat is a short URL to a poll. Okay. So um, I'll just say a few things about CODAP before we get going. Um, it's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's been in development for from four to eight years, depending on how you count. Um, it's free, it runs in a browser, meaning it's online, it doesn't require any sign-in, so it's pretty good for classroom use because kids can just go right to it. Um, and it's evolving because we collaborate with a number of curriculum development projects, um, I think we've collaborated with over a dozen so far, and um, each during each of these collaborations, we discover new things that that uh, would be helpful to our collaborators, and so we bring those things about, and we discover bugs, um, and we we fix those, and we discover things that are difficult for students. And so we attempt to fix those as well. So it's an evolving piece of software. Um, and if we don't encounter any bugs today, I will be flabbergasted. Um, now we're going to um, see some basic things. 
And we're going to see some what in CODAP land, I guess we would call advanced things. And, but we're not going to just do basics and then do advanced. They're going to kind of weave together. And Talia requested that when I, uh, when I do something that I think is a secret, that I let you know. <laughs> and being a secret means usually that we haven't documented it, um, which is an ongoing effort that we have. So I'm going to share my screen, my whole screen, and I'm going to make you guys small. And here's my slides document. And down here is a link to the um, poll that I posted in chat. And the next slide, so you will want to open this slide document because you will find links in it. And on the next page, this is a page where you can post questions. Now, you can also post questions in the chat, but if you post them here, um, then we can all see them when we go to this slide and we can think together about what questions, or I'll think about what questions to um, answer. It's also possible for you to use audio to just go ahead and um, interrupt um, if you're uh, somewhat circumspect about it and that um, will start us in a, on a conversation. So, um, and here is a page where when you find interesting things, you can make a text box about them. Bill? Yes. Can you, since there's an underline there, it's actually not clear what the letter is after the number seven in that short URL. Thank you, Dan. It's a Q. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. You mean for the slides document? Is that correct? Here, this is a Q. That was a perfect uh, example of someone using audio to ask a question in just the right way. My colleague Dan Damlin at um, Concord Consortium. Okay, so. I'm going to do some very basic things first. I'm going to show you the CODAP homepage, which is a page that you can bookmark. And if you press the Try CODAP button, that will open up CODAP with a blank document, which can be very useful. And also, here is a direct link to a blank CODAP document. So I'll open that. And you're presented with two possibilities. One is to open in a document, and there are example documents, or you may have stored a document on Google Drive or on your local file system. This document, Getting Started with CODAP, if, you, if you're new to CODAP, that's a really good thing to do yourself. And we have seen over and over again that it works very well in a classroom from middle school through college level um, as a way to get people started with CODAP. Now, um, there's help here. So if I choose help, I go to another web page, which has a bunch of, bunch of links to help things. For example, if I weren't, want to learn about tables, I can see this video and read and so on. And I think you'll hear Dan Demlin's voice if you play the video. Um, 
And there's also the CODAP website, which you've already seen. Actually, I want to go back to help for a moment uh, because there are help forums. And the CODAP help forum says it's plural, but actually it's there's just one. And um, this is a great place to post questions. Um, there have been 105 topics and you know, more than two replies per topic. And uh, it's, a, it's a great place to ask questions because then everybody benefits from both the question and the replies to it. Um, this menu here is we call affectionately the hamburger menu. And it's like the file menu in many pieces of software. And I'm going to close this document. And now I have a blank document. And we're going to use that in just a second. So did I cover all these things? I think I did. Good. And I'm going to go back and check the questions. Nope, no new questions. What is Kodak? Oh, well. Um, so hopefully, um, uh, you have, some of you, um, enough of you, have uh, filled out the poll. So I'm going to go to the responses page. You can go here, too. And how many responses we have? We have 13 so far. That's great. Now, we, and that's enough for us. Uh, but uh, if you haven't filled it out yet, please, please do. Um, we, we could use uh, this page to uh, take a look at the responses, but I'd rather uh, take a look at them in CODAP. So I'm going to download the responses. And uh, here they are. Um, but they're zipped, so I'm going to unzip them, which on a Macintosh just means I double-click them. And now I have um, a CSV file, which is comma-separated values. Um, though that kind of file and tab-delimited uh, files, Kodap can work with quite easily. So now I go back to CODAP and I adjust things so that I can see both the file itself and the CODAP window. And at that stage, I can just drag this in. And I have the data. Now, um, on the slide, I give you a link to um, my document, but in order for that link to work properly, I have to share. Uh oh, oh, that's because I used the wrong document. Okay, so um, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to use this document. Okay, now notice I'm in Google Drive, and for those of you who are familiar with Google Drive, you know that you can often double click a file. And once you get set up properly with CODAP, you can directly open CODAP here. And so I'm in an empty document. And if I do this thing that I just did again and get the data again, now I can do this thing that I was, uh, was trying to say. So this is, there is a link to a shared view of this document. And I want to make it so that when you use that link, you will get the data. So I update it, and it says it was updated successfully. And now, when I go here, you'll see Bill's, a copy of Bill's document is here. Um, if you've already opened this, you'll have to close it and try again. But if I, if I open it, you'll see that it looks just like the document that I was in a moment ago, except 
that um, it's my copy of that document. And this is very important in the classroom <clears throat> because you uh, may be the teacher for the classroom and you might have created a document that you want the students to use and you can give them a link to a shared view and that means that they can uh, all work with a copy of the document and their changes um, are independent of each other. Okay. Now, you should have either a copy of my document or have tried yourself to drag the responses into CODAP. And I would like you to play with those data. And I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes for that. And then I'm gonna start playing and we'll see some um, we'll see what's interesting about it. And two questions I have for you are, have you found anything that needs fixing? And are there any surprises? <clears throat> I said this is a workshop, but the way in which it's not a workshop is I have no idea what you're doing. I cannot see your screens, but I can see what you're doing in the slides. That's kind of nice. And now I see some questions, which I'll go ahead and answer while, while you're taking time to uh, explore that document. Can you use CodeApp on any device and with any browser? So CodeApp has been designed for desktop sized screens and it runs um, in Chromebooks, PCs, and uh, Macintosh browsers, it runs in any modern browser. Um, it does run on iPads, but there are some significant um, rough areas, I would call them, uh, which we will eventually fix. How can we make the CODAP working space bigger? Well, the CODAP working space is infinite, so I don't think you can make it bigger. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't actually understand this question. It can be <coughs> as big as your browser window, so if you make your browser window as big as possible, then it will be big. I think maybe one thing you could demo, Bill, is if you put something beyond the edge of the browser window, you'll get scroll bars to continually make more oh, stuff. Good idea. And uh, so I'm going to go to my document and um, make a graph. And let's just take a look at sex. And oh my goodness, there are so many sexes. It's a strange <laughs> world we live in, isn't it? But what Dan is pointing out is that if I put this down below, then I can scroll. So the document really is infinite in both directions. We've never had anyone make, use up more than a few screens worth, but there it is. Now, this, is a problem, isn't it? And um, I would like to show you one way to fix this. That is, we want just two sexes, apparently. We don't have any except for male or female. And here's an interesting way to do it. Now, I would say that this is not a secret, but an advanced technique, a very useful technique. And um, I'm going to take this column and drag it all the way to the left. We call this grouping. So I'm gonna group by these uh, various um, labels for sex, and then I'm gonna decide which label am I gonna actually use. I think I'll use lowercase male and female, 
So if I click here and type mail and make, I think I'm going to change that to lowercase mail. And female's fine. And female and lowercase female. Actually, I can copy this, can't I? Copy and paste. And this one is mail. Now it looks like I haven't really done anything because I still have eight groups. But notice over here my graph, it's been um, reformatting as I've been going along. And if I drag this back into the cases, and then again over here, now you see I have just two. Um, groups, one male and one female. And they correspond to these points. So these points are the groups. They are no longer the people that they were before. Um, they are the groups. So if I click on one, I'm selecting the female group, and I've selected all of the females who filled out the poll. Okay, now I would like to see how familiar people are with CODAP because that then I can adjust my um, pace accordingly. And when I have a categorical attribute like this one, I like to put them on the vertical axis by default because they're easier to read <coughs> horizontally. You can see that if I put them on the vertical, on the horizontal axis, then I have to prick my head like that, and I don't like that as much. So, did you notice it flipped from from vertical to horizontal axis? And I can undo. Undo is very useful. It doesn't always work. Okay, so we've got a couple people who've never used it, and three people who have used it a lot. Dan, I bet you're one of those. And um, you guys who've used it a lot can chime in with things that you've discovered over time. Um, I'm gonna go back and check the questions. Looks like no new questions. All right. So um, now um, I'm just looking at some of these attributes. What is your date of birth? So let's take a look at that. And I'm going to, it's going to be obvious. The nice thing here is that CODAP understands dates. So when we make a graph with dates, um, chances are it will line up uh, on something that makes sense to us. And if I expand this, which I can do by dragging on one end or the other, if I drag in the middle, you'll see a little tooltip there. It says drag to translate the axis scale. Well, I want to expand it. And I'm doing that so that eventually we will see um, months as well. There we go. So this nice axis um, shows you more detail. Most of you probably know about the rescale button. It's a good way to get all the data back on the display. Um, so that's dates. My goodness, we have a, a very quite a young person here, 18 years old. Maybe that's one of the students. Of course, I said you could fib, so who knows. Um, now, another thing that people did was to put in their location. Um, and one of these is latitude, and one of these is longitude. That suggests that we might be able to make a map. So I'm going to make a map, and nothing happened. So um, I shouldn't have been surprised. Um, the reason nothing happened is that CODAP doesn't know 
that these are latitude and longitudes. So I'm going to close the map and change the name of these attributes, which I do by editing the attribute properties. So I think I'll just call this latitude. There are some magic words, if you will. Latitude is one, lat is another way to do it. So there's latitude, and I'm gonna do longitude. And now, if I make a map, crossing my fingers, that always helps. Look at that, there we are. So, who's this person? That's this person in California. Of course, it's anonymous, so we don't know who it is. A lot of people in the East, nobody in the Midwest. Most, I guess this person qualifies as Midwest. And we've got, how many people do we have over here? Well, one thing I could do is double click and zoom in to see if I get more than one person, and I don't think so. Um, even though we, I know we have two German folks here. And again, rescale uh, takes me back so I can see everybody. Now, you also uh, put in um, states. So it would be really nice to see the states on this map. And I'm going to show you one way to do that. Um, first of all, I'm going to edit the name of that. And I'm just going to call it state. And you might say, really? That's all you have to do to get state on the map? No, that isn't all you have to do. State is not a magic word. But if I make a new attribute here, oh, okay, I promised bugs, right? Mm -hmm. So um, an error has occurred that may affect how this program behaves. So this is CODAP's way of saying that something went wrong. And um, when we get reports of these, we fix them as soon as we can. So I am going to, um, I'm going to save this and I'll show you <coughs> that I can save it on my local hard drive and download it. And then if I go back to my file system, here is my document and I'm gonna drag it in here and I get it back, it looks just like it did, and I'm gonna hope, oh, there's my new attribute, and let's see if I can edit the properties. Actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Yes, it, it is what I wanted to do, edit the properties of this one, and this time I'm okay. Now I'm gonna use a magic word, which is boundary, and I don't have to do this because I've used that magic word, but I could say that the type of this attribute is boundary. And that, mean, that means it would work even if I didn't use the magic word boundary. So I apply that. And then I'm, I write a formula. Okay. Now, some, many people find formulas confusing. And this is an area that we want to improve. But I'll just show you what you can do. So I'm going to insert a function. And here are lists of functions. And I know that what I'm looking for is a lookup function. But you wouldn't know that, probably. And if I click on it, I see a bunch of possibilities. And one of them is lookup boundary. Ooh, that looks very promising. And if I go to the information icon here, I get a whole bunch of information about looking up boundaries. And so, oh, and I get examples. 
Here's one, US state boundaries and the state of Georgia. I wanna do something like that. So I go back up to the top, I click on this, I click on boundary set, and here in the boundary, here in the values menu are the, th the, is the thing I'm looking for, which is the US state boundaries, and then the boundary key. So that in the example that was quote Georgia or GA, but really what I want is to use the state attribute. So we wanna look up US state boundaries using the state attribute. So I apply that and ah, I can tell that it worked because these little boundaries are showing up. And now if I make a map, I can see that there's California and there's New York and what is that one? I can't tell. But can you see that some of the states, excuse, excuse us German folks, we're gonna zoom in on the United States. Can you see that some of them are darker than others? And that's because there are more people with, uh, that are from that state and we have one um, polygon for Michigan for each of those people and we have one polygon for Maine for each of these two people. And that's not terrible, but it would be nice to um, fix that. So I'm going to jet drag state all the way to the left. Oh, and I got that error again. A different, it's certainly a different error. And now I think I'm in trouble. So fortunately I can recover. Um, and actually what I should have done and will do this time is to have um, saved it not on my local hard drive because it's not auto saved there, but on um, Google Drive where it is auto saved. Okay, so this time I'm gonna save it on my Google Drive and you'll see, I'll just save it at the top level, that it's saving and when I make changes, which I'm gonna do very soon. Ah, let me show you another thing. So I'm kind of flipping back and forth between basic things and more um, advanced things. Now this next thing I'm gonna show you is not an advanced thing at all, and it's a very useful thing. It's switching from the table, the case table, to the case card. So the case card is nice because I can see all of these attributes at once. And when I wanna drag something, like drag state over, along with sex, I guess. And let me put sex back. Then I can make a new attribute right here, which I'll name boundary. So those of you who, for whom this was confusing the first time, lucky you, you get to see it again. Isn't it good we're recording this? So boundary, and I don't need to type it as boundary, but I will. And then I want to edit the formula. Now this time, instead of going down into this menu, I'm just gonna start typing look up. Oh, there it is. So if I click on it or just press return, I'm home free. And then I remember that the thing that I wanna put in there starts with US and I can click on state boundaries and it fills in. And then I remember that the second thing I would need 
is the state. So I'm just going to start typing state. Oh, look, it's right there at the top. Press return, and I've got it. So let's see how we're doing here. Well, um, if I go through here, I can see I'm getting those nice little boundary things. So that's hopeful. And um, notice up here, it's saving. So that means that if I crash or, um, well, let's say if I crash, then reloading will bring me this document back. So I reload and voila, I've got them again. Okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. There are still differences in color, and I bet that's because we've got some repeats for the names. California, Rhode Island, CA. See how we have both California and CA? And that created two different cases. So I could go back here and edit this and edit it to CA. And now when I make a map, this might not have been obvious to you, but yeah, well, there's still more than one California. But anyway, notice how hovering, I saw it there, there we go. State PA, state New York. So that's a, a useful thing. It does that by looking at the topmost attribute. Whew. Right. That was an adventure. I still think that there's only one California bill. <laughs> you do, huh? There, there was a couple of questions in the Zoom chat along with in the slides. So All right, let's do the Zoom it. chat. Okay. Um, actually, both seem to be just asking to do a quick, like, can I see it again type thing. So Sean Connor is asking, um, can, how do you get the x-axis to see months again? So can you demonstrate like the dragging of axes again? I can. Here I am. So what I did before was to stretch this, keep stretching it until the months appeared. Come on, months. I know you're there. There. Okay. Very nice. All right. And then this is a perfect. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go ahead. I want to show you something else. This is a secret. If I hold my mouse under this group of points on the axis and hold down the shift, the option key on my keyboard, notice that the cursor becomes a plus. Now I can just click and it will expand right around those points so we can see how close. Oh, their birthdays are so close. This one is 411, and this is 418. So you're almost birthmates. Like the birthday problem. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. OK, what was the next question? Uh, actually, this is a great lead in, which is, um, can you demonstrate the rescale button again? So. OK, so I don't see all the points. I want to see them. So I go up here. And it says rescale display to show all the data. I click it, and lo and behold, I can see all the data. That works in the map also. I think I showed this. If I rescale here, now I can see our German friends. By the way, we have as one of the attributes um, what country do you live in? And we can show boundaries for countries in much the same way that we did with um, states. So now I'm going here. How do you move data from X to Y axis in the graph? I, this is all telling me that I'm moving a little too quickly at times. All right, suppose I want to put this date axis on the Y axis this date 
attribute on the y-axis. I just click and drag, and you can see it's coming along with me, and move over there and let go. And the points move. Similarly, I can move this down here, and the points move. I hope that was sufficient. In the case card view, how do I see a cases card? Good question. Well, one way is to click over here or click somewhere on a dot. These dots represent people. And now I see that person. And if I click on another person, I see that person. By the way, if I select a bunch of people, oh, did you see how I did that? I click and drag and then release. It tells me that I have six selected out of 13. And for things that are numeric, it's, it, tell, it gives me a range. And for things that are uh, categories with just a few categories, it lists them. And it turns out that all of these people I selected have used it a bit myself. Why is that? Oh, it's because I selected them and they were all in that group. Okay, I hope that answered that question. PCs, ah, don't have an option button. Yes, uh, the Alt button is the, is the magic PC button. How do you change the range of an axis so I can only see one part of the dates or other values? Okay. So let me work here. Let's say I only want to see from 1970 to 2000. I can grab this axis in the middle where it says drag to translate axis scale. So I can drag this down like that. So that fixed that part. And then I can drag this up until I get to 2000. And I'm seeing the range that I said I wanted to see. You might think that there should be some shortcut for this, like allowing me to type in something, but there isn't. By the way, if in the help forum, you, instead of a question, uh, made a request, like, I wish it was possible to type in the bounds of the axes, that has the effect of getting our development team more motivated to provide that feature. So um, that's, that's one way that you can influence the progress of um, code app development. Mm -hmm. You're uh, asking questions faster than, no, I guess I'm doing okay. Okay, if 20 of my students enter data to Google Sheet, then how can we transfer the Google Sheet to code app? Google Sheet. Okay. Google Sheet. I believe that there is a way to see this as a sheet. I think it's the... You have an idea? I think so. So click on the little green square. Ah, create spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Create new spreadsheet. Yep. That's the one. Google Sheets. Okay. Oh, now I've got 15 responses too. Yeah. And here is no. You, you had a pop up get blocked in your browser. Oh, I did. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So there's the spreadsheet and the file menu will allow me to download as a CSV. So I do that and I get another one of these and I go back to my document or I go to my new document. 
uh, yeah, I go to my new document. Let me make a new document. I'm going to make a new document by close. Oh, I'll make a new document by new. That makes a new tab, and here's my document. And I think I can drag it right here and let go. And there's my data that have come from um, a Google Sheet. Let's see. Okay, and there's one more question in Zoom as well. Go for it. Um, the question is, how are you able to see both data points and state boundaries on the map plot at once? Um, this person says that they only see state boundaries on their screen. Ah, well, that's very interesting. It's a very good question. I would have to ask you, you only see state boundaries. So you succeeded in doing this, but did you name, did you rename the latitude and longitude um, attributes? By the way, in CODAP land, we call these things attributes. Many people call them variables or fields. There's all kinds of names for them. We call them attributes, by the way, because the word variable is already quite overloaded. And um, in mathematics land, doesn't really mean the same thing as we do in data land. So we prefer attribute. Uh, so um, let us know if that doesn't work, um, renaming those things. So Bill, I ran into this too, and I think that what worked for me was to just close the map window uh, and reopen it. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. Um, the map should be smarter if you change something from latitude, uh, other name to latitude and this one to longitude. It should immediately show you the points, but it doesn't. And that's what we call a missing feature, or some people would call it a bug. And um, I have it on my list to fix that, actually. Thank you, Talia. Great. Yeah, so closing the map and making a new one often fixes problems like that. All right, now I'm going down here. We did that. There's more about maps. So you can uh, open these documents if you like, but I'm going to move fairly quickly and we're mostly in demo mode now for a moment. So um, here's my shared link to this document that says South American Earthquakes and Cities. Isn't that pretty? What I like about this is that we've got two data sets. You may not have known that that's possible in CODAP. And these country boundaries, like this, are coming from here. And the cities are coming from here. And the earthquakes, which are these little gray dots, are coming from here. So really, we've got three sources of map data, and they're all put together on one map. So we like to think of this map as joining together all of these data and putting them in a place where they can be looked at um, in a common way because they all have to do with latitudes and longitudes. So making these this kind of document is kind of an advanced thing. It's not hard though. And um, manipulating such a document is pretty easy because it works just like any map and you don't have to think about the fact that there are three sets of data here. But I wanna show you a feature of CODAP that is very useful in a situation like this. Suppose we wanna know which of these cities 
are, oh, by the way, I should say a little bit about the context. These are significant earthquakes going back to 1806. They're all from South America. And um, one of our collaborators is developing a module of curriculum material one piece of which is that students try to identify cities that are at greater risk than others for earthquakes. And so the question becomes, which of these cities are near a lot of past earthquakes? Now you could do this manually, or you could you know, just go explore around this map. By the way, if I double click, of course, it um, uh, zooms in and I can see things in more detail, but there's another way to do it, which is to make a grid of the significant earthquakes. That's interesting, isn't it? And I think it's less confusing if I turn off the points. Now I've just got the grid and the darker color tells me that there are more earthquakes in that square. Now I'm going to make the squares as big as possible. And we still have our cities, right? So here's a, um, a square with 13 significant earthquakes in the past. And there are three cities there. One of them is Ambato in Ecuador, and Quito, and what was the last one? There it is, Santo Domingo. And so we could say that those are uh, cities that um, where there's been in the past significant earthquake activity. And here there are two, there are 11 earthquakes and maybe that passes muster and so we would we would uh, look for these two cities too that happen to be in Peru. So this technique of using the grid which we might also call a heat map um, is a way to get kind of summary information about um, a, a geographic variable and it turns out to be amazingly frequently useful. You can think of it, if you will, as let's suppose we tilted the map so that it were horizontal, and for each of these squares we had a, a, a rectangular parallel pipe head coming directly off the surface, and some of them are tall and some of them are short, and in some areas there are none at all. Okay, did I do what I wanted? Okay, yes, I did the things I wanted to do there, and I want to show you one other thing, and this is a very advanced technique, so you can tune this out if you like. This document, even though it's an advanced technique, it's a very nice document. So notice that we have uh, apparently volcanoes and eruptions of them, and we have latitude and longitude. So that's good. That signals that we can make a map. Notice we have 9,813 um, eruptions of volcanoes. So that's our, our biggest data set yet so, so far. Um, and uh, the points overlap quite a bit. So in case you didn't see this, I can um, change the point size and that lets me see a in a little bit greater detail. And if I like, there are eruptions. I think I should color them red. And maybe I would like, I'll 
the stroke around them to be black. Ooh, ugh, ugh, ugh. No good. Let's see if undo works. Yes, okay. Now, does anybody see anything else in this map in addition to the volcanic eruptions? Don't be shy. Well, it's not, thank you, Dan. Um, it's not really a classroom, so it's not fair. But notice these white lines here, and if I'm clever, I can actually click on them. No, I guess I'm not clever. If I click over here, I can highlight them, and these are the plate boundaries. Now, what I want you to notice, the, the advanced technique, if you will, is that there's no formula here. It's just a bunch of gobbledygook called, in technical jargon, um, GeoJSON. And if you paste GeoJSON into um, a cell of a case and label the attribute boundary, then CodeApp will try to interpret this as lines or polygons on the map. And so that worked very nicely in this situation uh, because we could show both the plate boundaries and the um, volcanic eruptions. And notice of course, we could now dive into the context here and be fascinated by the fact that the volcanoes are right along plate boundaries. In fact, I'm, I'm noticing for the first time that they are on one side of a plate boundary. They don't straddle the plate boundary particularly. Isn't that interesting? And oh, and there's ice. Ah, sorry, I got, I was falling down a black hole. All right, now I'm going back. I'm, I have escaped from the black hole. Do we have any more questions? No. Any more chat questions? Um, there's one, but I'm not sure I understand it. Oh, I see. It's for some clarified. How would we include the plate boundaries in a fresh file? Yes, what a good question. Well, ah, yeah, so how do you do this? Well, on the, um, on the web, if you search for um, GeoJSON uh, plate boundaries, I'm not going to take the risk of actually trying that, but um, very likely you will find them. And then you can copy the stuff that you find on the web and just paste it like here. Here I am and I can paste. So uh, let's try this. If I copy and paste, yes, I got it. And now, I should have two of these. There's one, and there's the other one. Oh, they look identical. That's actually good, isn't it? Um, so that's how you would do that. By the way, if you were looking for a particular um, set of uh, boundaries, you could ask on the CodeApp help form and maybe someone would find them for you. Okay, taking a deep breath, thinking what I want to do next. How are we doing on time? It's 10 o'clock. I'm down to here, dragging attributes. Now, I hope you didn't close your About Us file, because uh, I want you to do a little exploration. There are at least 10 places you can drag attributes in Kodak. Some people would say there are actually 13 of them. 
let's list them all. So I think I have separate little text boxes here. And Dan, you're not allowed to do this unless you find one you didn't know about before. Um, so let, let me show you what I mean. Here's my other one with the graph. So here's a graph. Here are some attributes. Let me drag an attribute. Where can I drag this attribute? Oh, I could drag it here. Or here, that's the x-axis. Or here. So I wonder what happens when I do that. You'll find out. And when you find one that no one else has found yet, no, you can't just say, oh, in the graph. That's in the middle of the graph. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind editing that to say in the middle of the graph, that would be great. Okay. Once again, I wish I could see what you're doing. I love your anonymous names, anonymous alligator. Yes, good one. Lynn found an unusual one. By the way, you've seen that maps are very like graphs. I wonder if it's possible to drag attributes into maps. Is there a sub question about where you can drag attributes from? Uh, I didn't plan on that, but, and it doesn't count as one of the uh, places uh -huh. within the table to reorder attributes. Uh -huh. An anonymous moose, when you dragged into the map, what did it do? You've seen that you could drag in the left part of the graph. Are there any circumstances in which you might be able to drag in the right part of the graph? I'm not sure about the title. What does the title mean? Okay, so Talia, if you would keep this page up, I'm going to go into the document, and um, where's my one that had a map? Oh, I lost it. Well, I can use this one. Um, if I put the, if I drag the duration attribute, let me make my points bigger again. That's good. And I drag into here. This is taking a while because there are 9,000 points. 
Hopefully I haven't broken code app. Come on. By the way, this is a good opportunity to say that we know that there are many situations in which we wish CodeApp would be faster about things. And this is a um, perennial um, charge of ours to make CodeApp faster. And I think I know why this is so slow. I'm going to I'm going to refresh this page and bring it back again. See if I'm successful with that. Or I can just go to there, here. And if I do that, I'm going to... Oh yeah, here's why it took so long. It made 9,300 and such uh, categories um, because there's probably some things that are not numeric in there, and I should have checked that first. Um, and the way you check to see if something is going to work as numbers is to make a graph. And I am going to, now I'm going to show you something else. So 9,800 is a lot. And I'm going to say, I'm only going to work with, I only want to work with one volcano, this one. How can I get rid of these other volcanoes? The answer is, I come over here and I say, set aside selected cases. No, I don't want to set aside the selected cases. Right, Dan? Right, unselected cases. <laughs> I want to set aside the unselected cases, which will just leave all of the eruptions of this one volcano, and there are 48 of them. Now, when I drag duration down here, let's see. Oh, yeah, look at that. Somehow, some of these are not being treated as numbers, or maybe none of them are being treated as numbers. Let's see. If I click on here and say treat as numeric, and this is a very useful thing to know about, then CodeApp will try to treat those things as numbers. And that worked and um, raises the interesting question about what does a negative duration mean? And did a volcano really last for negative 4,000 years? And so on. So let me drag this attribute into a map. And by the way, now our map is only going to have one. Ah, all the points are going to be on the same place, aren't they? So this is not a good example of dragging into a map, but I think we learned, we, the royal we, learned some interesting things through that. Still looking for that about us that had a map. Oh well. So when you drag into a map, like this one, no, not this one, this one, what do I want to drag? I'm going to drag population. I drag it in. It's treated numerically. And I see it twice, which is a bug. But here's the population of my cities. And they're divided into five groups. And I can click on this legend and see the points that correspond to each population grouping. Or I could drag country in here, 
Let's see if this works. And now I've colored the countries. Let me get rid of those earthquakes. Yes. Now I've colored the countries. And so both the points and the um, polygons are colored according to this key. And if I click on the key down here, I select both the cities and the countries corresponding to it. So that's dragging into a map. Ah, let's do this. Let's do this. About us. And we have some numeric attributes here. I asked you to choose a number. What do you think will be the most common number? Ah, maybe we have 73 and 73. How likely is that? And 77 and 77. So those were the duplicates. Very odd. So that's one. Now let's see if there's any correlation between the number you chose and your height. How about that? Nope. Not a bit. And do I have another numeric attribute? Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put height. I'm going to put height. No, I'm going to put date of birth down here. Again, no correlation. And that allows me to take the number and put it in various places. So if I put it here, it will replace that attribute. But if I put it up here where the plus is, now I have two sets of points, the ones corresponding to the integer and the one corresponding to the height. And this is a good example of a useless, meaningless graph, would you say? Now, suppose, just for the sake of argument, I wanted to put longitude, let's say latitude, on the, on the y-axis also. I could do that. Let's say I want to put longitude on the y-axis. I could do that. But really, longitude is off here by itself. So let's not do that. Rescale. Oh, I screwed up. I encountered a bug that didn't tell me that a bug was happening, which also happens. And hopefully, I can simply do the graph again. And I'm going to put the date of birth here and the height. Ah, so I hope, pardon me for being somewhat um, diversion, easily diverted, I would say. And it's because I think of things that you ought to know um, in this workshop. If this were a workshop about some data, then I wouldn't be so diverted, so easily diverted. But I want to I, I want to look at the edit uh, the, the attribute properties again for a moment because of this unit thing. And it's very nice to put a unit in, in this case inches. Ah, look at that. But it worked, showing the unit there. And if I drag this over to the axis, the axis has the unit on it. So if you're making a CODAP document for other people like students to use, this can be a very important thing to do for them. And it can be important for you too, if you're gonna spend significant time with a particular um, document. Now I'm gonna take longitude and I'm gonna put it over here on the right. And I bet nobody found this 
because you have to have two numeric attributes, a scatter plot to do this. And when you do it, you get a new scale here and the longitude points are moving independently of the uh, date, of the, the height points. So that enables me to have two different scales and still be able to compare um, what's going on with the values. And I wish I had uh, set things up so that we could have a, a useful and meaningful example, but I didn't. Back to the questions. We're still okay. Any questions in the Zoom chat? Um, I answered one, but maybe just to confirm it. Um, how many cases are the recommended maximum limit to make code app work relatively fast? Well, I would say from three to 5,000, and it depends strongly on your uh, hardware. So, uh, for example, if you have low-end Chromebooks, I would say 3,000. But if you have high-end Chromebooks or um, high, uh, normal uh, computers, certainly 5,000 uh, works well. And you saw me working with 9,000. And until I ch uh, charged CodeApp with creating 9,800 categories, uh, it was doing fine. Great. Um, and then Lynn is asking, give some examples where it helps to have two attributes on the same axis. Okay, like let's comparing see. Comparing two trends, for example. Comparing two trends, that's a great example. So let's suppose uh, you have uh, hits to your website over time, mm -hmm. and um, um, you want, and, and there are two websites you could have time be your horizontal axis and uh, number of hits be the on the uh, uh, be occurring twice on the y axis um, another one um, ah yeah suppose you wanted to plot position and velocity well, they have different units and they probably have different scales. You could put position, you could put time on the horizontal axis, position on the x axis, and velocity on, I'm sorry, position on the y axis, and velocity on the other y axis. Nice. And then. This isn't a question so much as probably worth discussion though. Um, Ian writes, this is such a great activity to engage kids in data exploration, such as an activity about guessing who this case is. Instructors need to pick good questions to ask so that it would be not too easy to guess who the case is, and it would be beneficial to learn some data related concepts. Yeah, and that suggests another workshop that we could do about the pedagogy of data. Mm -hmm. That would be quite nice. Thank you for that comment. Oh, I had a thought and it evaporated. Maybe it will come back. Okay. Makes a legend. Ah, you can drag into the middle of a graph like this one. What is your sex? If I drag it in the middle, I color the points. I can select all the males and I can select all the females. What if I wanted to compare? Oh, that's date of birth. Let's change it to height. Yikes, what happened? What happened there? I have, that's, one, that's a bug I have not seen before. And now we're gonna drag sex onto the x-axis. And now this is kind of getting at Jan's question or someone's question. Um, maybe Lynn's question. 
Oh, to compare, I, I see, uh, Christian, Christian's question, mm -hmm. to compare two genders. So we're comparing two genders and something is broken, maybe. And I come over here and say, height. I bet mean is a good way to compare heights. And I check that and I can see the heights of the men and the women in our small group. Okay, back to my slideshow. So I leave it as homework for you to find the several more places you can drag things. And let's go on to plugins. Aha! Plugins are amazing. So we've been looking at built-in features of CODAP. But CODAP is highly extensible, and we'll understand that in a moment. So I'm going to open this um, data set, which is moderately large, 5,000 people. And, oh, and let's say I don't want to work with 5,000 people. Let's say I want to work with 10 people. In other words, I want to sample 10 people out of the 5,000. Well, there's a plugin for that. It's called the sampler, of course. And the sampler is a beautiful beast. Those of you who may know about Tinkerplots uh, will recognize that it is modeled on Tinkerplots, which has a very powerful sampler. Um, and we're doing this with one of our collaborating projects, namely uh, the North Carolina State University esteem project and they helped us develop this sampler both by providing funding and by um, helping us design something that worked well and testing it it was it is it is really a great collaboration so here we have sampled from using the mixer of these uh, three balls we could add more balls if we wanted um, we can also use a spinner, which works the same way. Let's try it. And I can change the speed. Let me make it go faster. And you can see that we're uh, getting uh, values here. And we could make a graph of those values by dragging onto the horizontal axis. Look at that, why do we have so many A's? And if I drag experiment over here, why did experiment one have no C and D? And you of course can answer those questions. But I'm gonna use the samplers collector. Before I start, I'm gonna clear the data. Boop, everything went away. And then I go to the collector and it's loading collections and it's choosing ACS data. And I'm a little confused that there's nothing in here, but let's go ahead anyway and say I want my samples to be of size 10 and I'll just make one of them. And I should be seeing little balls in here. And it's not working. Stop. Start. Oh! I got something, but no values. Let's try it again. Try clicking on refresh list. Refresh list. Oh, who said, who suggested that? Uh, Linda. 
Lynn, thank you. All right, let's clear the data again and try this. I don't want to go fastest though, I want to see it slower. Start. Female. Female. See how they're just barely shuffling. 5,000 is a lot. I don't think I've ever put 5,000 in the mixer before. And here they are. And so I could make a graph of age. And there's my uh, graph. And if I put sample on the y-axis, I have only one sample so far. So let's clear data again, and this time we're going to collect 10 samples. And I'm going to move this over here to fastest and start. Come on, code app. You can do it. Yes. But where's the point? I guess I'll make a new graph. So I hope I'm modeling um, the behavior of um, trying to work around bugs. That's my intention. There, there's my samples. And if I show the mean, I see all these samples, and it would be really nice to be able to collect all those values. Those of you who are stats geeks, stat geeks, will understand my interest in doing that. And now we're going to make a data move, which is a term we've been experimenting with for well over a year now. And this data move is creating a measure. So I'm going to click plus here. And come on. There's my new attribute. And I'm going to call it mean age. Well, calling it mean age doesn't actually do anything. But if I write a formula, here's my my good old friend, the formula editor, insert a function. Hmm. I want to compute the mean. That's a statistical function, right? Oh my God, look at them all. And if I go here, I can see information about doing that. Um, and if I click on this, it just enters it. Now, what do we mean? Oh, and there were examples in there. So an example is um, age for here, age. And I don't need a filter. I want the mean age for all of the ones in each of these 10 groups. And there they are. And let me make this smaller. So I can make a new graph and plot the means here. Oh, look at that, that's so nice. And if I click on one of these, oh, there's the sample it came from. Isn't that nice? And now I'm going to be a little nitpicky here and try to make the scales pretty similar here. And you can see that the means are less spread out, have a smaller standard deviation than the ages themselves. 
And by the way, if we wanted to see that standard deviation, we could. Have we still got anybody left? No, everybody's, most everybody's still here. That's, couple, that's great. A couple of people waved goodbye on their way to meetings. Uh -huh. uh, but there, there were a couple of great questions in Zoom chat. So okay. this is a good place. Wait. Ah, <coughs> I have a question here too. <laughs> Excellent. Can you put a variable on the size of the bubbles? No, but several, several, this gets asked fairly frequently, and we want to be able to do it. It would be so great in maps, you know, where you want to indicate the size of an earthquake or a city by the size of the circle. If you ask this on the help forum, that will help us and maybe you. What do we have in the... Um, there. So Rob asks, is there a plugin or data set which has proven most effective in engaging students? There are so many kinds of engagement. I mean, that getting started plugin engages students, but it's not deep, it's just getting started. The, um, there are games that generate data, and those have engaged students. Ah, it's time to go to the plugin page. But before we do that, was there another question like Christian's here? Yes, this is the second question. Is there a plugin to run NetLogo simulations? Oh, it's another plugin. I saw a couple examples linked in the presentation. I mean our own simulations. Okay, so it is time to go to the plugin page. And I have a link to that down here somewhere. Oh, we're going to skip plugin. We're going to skip color values and scraping. And where's plugins? Oh, everybody's on it. I couldn't see it. Okay, here we go. There's a whole page of plugins. And someone asked, Christian asked about NetLogo as a plugin. And yes, you can make. NetLogo plugins, and the ability to do so is actually in the language now. So you can make CodeApp plugins with NetLogo. And this one is called Ants. And if I set up and go, we will see that the ants are flowing. And if I make a table, by the way, notice that to get the table, I have to choose it. And there's that. And if I make a graph, I can put time on the horizontal axis. And what can I put on the? I can put food far. You might want to pause the simulation. Yeah? Maybe it finished. Food far. What does that mean? Ah, oh, okay. I don't really understand this simulation, though I have played with it in the past. And if I go, if I scroll down a little bit, I should be able to see more. But anyway, sorry, that's my calendar. Um, I can um, look at this, food far, food close. I guess those things that it started out there are food. And so now I've got three timelines here. And guess what? The food that's close got eaten first. And the food that's far got eaten last. Let's set it up again and go again. So now I believe these are food, and this is the ant hive. Is that what you call those? Nest? Colony. Colony, there we go. And bang. 
They go out. I see. We're eating the food as we go. And you can see in this graph here that a new line that's very similar to the old line is being, oh my God, look at that. Now the far food is going to go quickly. So isn't this fun? I'll just note, uh, Magdalena who, Sorger, who is uh, in charge of this thing called Ant Picnic, is uh, involved in having kids actually around the world try various different kinds of food. And she's actually interested in the data because lots of different species of ants and uh, beginning to collect data about how far ants travel to, for different kinds of food. And this little simulation, I'm assuming, is a way for the kids to basically get their feet with, with the concepts. Sounds good to me, Bill. Yeah. Okay, so we tried a net logo simulation, and there are others here. Um, I think I had an idea of one that I wanted to try. Oh, Sage Modeler. Okay, so a plugin is something that lives in CODAP and generates data, typically, but not always. Sometimes it does other things. And um, I'm going to show Sage Modeler and maybe I made a document. I did. So instead of a blank, so this is a plugin and it's a systems dynamic modeling tool that Dan has been um, developing through the Building Models Project for low three years, going into the fourth year. And it's a great tool for middle school and up to show relationships between things. This one is about caddisflies and how big the caddisflies get. And you can, you can build a model and these things move around and you can make new connections and describe the connections. <coughs> That's a whole workshop in itself. And you can also, let's increase the experiment number and record a data stream so that if I come over here and change the leaf litter mass, I get more points in my graphs, but they aren't particularly a nice thing because the temperature is not changing, so the ammonia and caddisfly size are just the same. So I'm going to make a leaf litter mass graph, and that comes over here and I see what I did with leaf litter. And I could, if I wanted, say, I wonder, let's, let's flip this. I wonder what there might be the relationship between leaf litter. Oh, come on, you can do this. Oh, this doesn't work there, right. Well, but you probably don't, you're probably not using the, um... Process. Yeah, I'm not. If I do this, though, yeah, there, and I see it's a linear relation. So we could spend, we could have started with Stage Modeler at the beginning of the workshop, and we would still be there. It's a, an amazing you, tool. One of the secrets you might talk about is the parent visibility talk. Ah, yes. Know what that means. See this, this little group of vertical vertically oriented points, those are from before. Suppose I only want to look at the last set of points. Now when I do a new experiment and I'll only have those two things I can change. 
but let's change temperature again. Notice that that straight line of points went away because these are my most recent points and you can actually see them over here too. And if I go to here and say show parent visibility toggles, catchy name, and last, now I see my last run, my last experiment. Isn't it good we're recording this? Because you can go back and watch this again. So let me pause for a moment. I had some other things that I thought I might do. Some things about color values and scraping from web pages and more about joining data sets. And many people ask about sliders. What are slide sliders for? So I was gonna show some stuff about that. And then there's some kind of geeky, geeky but important stuff about documents. And I wonder if we could, since nobody used this, I'll do it here and make a bulleted list. Uh, color, scraping, joining. So that's one. Um, what was the next one? Um, we had, uh, let's see, did you get like sliders? Sliders, yeah. Sliders and documents. Okay, so come in here and vo oh, is this going to work? It's not really going to work. Let me just ask, you can turn on audio and uh, shout out, which of these would you like to spend the last 10 minutes, five minutes on? Mm -hmm. I feel there's also some questions too, so we can try to respond, those, respond to those as well. Okay. I guess you're gonna let me choose, aren't you? All right, I will. <laughs> what are the questions? Well, let's see. So, I'm curious whether you know any projects that combine the beauty of data and the beauty of writing. Right now, most are with STEM subjects. Well, there's a project called Zoom in Science that does have students write quite a bit, but I don't think they're concerned with the aesthetics of writing. So I guess I would have to answer that. No, I don't. Okay. Great. And then Christian asks, um, how, is, how do you plug your own NetLogo simulation into CodeApp? He said there's some kind of option from maybe the NetLogo website or somewhere else. Yes. I can't answer that in the time available. Um, you can ask it on the CodeApp web. Code app help form, and I think if you did, then I would uh, go to a, a colleague that works in with the Net Logo project and ask them to respond. Wonderful. And the follow-up to that was whether visualizing one's own writing is engaging for students. Um, this is back to, sorry, I, I lost a little bit of track here. Um, so we're talking about NetLogo and then Yan in follow-up to the writing and the beauty of writing question was wondering um, if that would be engaging for students, you think? I don't know. I have wondered about looking at words as uh, literature, students of literature do with data. 
uh, but I don't oh, have any ask the question, uh, uh, Villain, I ask question because in one uh, classroom uh, implementation, we asked students to write science fictions. And in that project, uh, when they work in groups and one student does not really like the other students writing, just say, I just wanted to let the other student know how many the, the students are using in this mm -hmm. paragraph uh, like mm -hmm. that. So I'm guessing, I, I have never done an experiment with it before. Yes. And the fact that they could generate their own data is, is an interesting thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay, I've decided I'm going to do this. We're going to generate a normal distribution whose mean and standard deviation are determined by sliders. And I will close this and make a new table. It currently has zero cases in it, but if I click on this green thing here, I can insert cases. I'm going to insert a hundred cases. And I'm going to rename the, the attribute to be just value or number. So these are gonna be numbers that are distributed normally. And I'm gonna have a slider, which I'm gonna rename to be mean and a second slider that I'm going to rename to be SD for standard deviation. Now I'm going to write a formula and insert a function. Let's see. Not there. other functions. Yes, there it is. Random normal. Oh, look, it put in exactly the right words. How likely is that? <coughs> and when I apply, look, I get numbers. And if I make a graph of those numbers, I get the distribution. And what do you think will happen if I change the mean by dragging. Oh, I sent them way off. Let's send them all the way up there and then bring the scale down. There they are. What will happen if I change the standard deviation? Oh, I get new distributions with standard deviations. What will happen if I animate both of these sliders at the same time? Let me start that one again. Ooh. Is that weird or what? <laughs> Let's see what Rescale does. Boink. So I'm going to stop sharing. I can see some of you. And um, just um, those of you who are not using your video, you could, this would be a great time to turn on your video so that you can, so that everybody can see you. And um, I guess all I really have time for is to thank you for coming. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Well, hi, really, Bill. Really useful. <laughs> hi, Bill. That was on, on, the, on the one side of California. And actually, I was surprised about the earthquake data. And uh, we have a project on like a risk and geohazard management. So I think that we will get to you to discuss what's possible with the code app. Thank you so much on that side. You're welcome, Lisa. Uh, Rob, did we get a chance to answer your question in Zoom chat about simulation? You're muted. Yes, I, yes, and I'll, um, I'll follow up as well because of the, the links that Natalia just sent too. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Well, Do you have any parting words? Uh, yes, we are at time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. So go to screen share. Open up this window.
And it's already maximized. Okay. Well, I had a terrific time on this webinar. Thank you, Bill. I'm and so glad you were sitting next to me. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was, I, had a, I had a great time. It was so much fun. Um, again, if we did not get to your question or you want to leave additional questions for us, feel free to email us or um, you can also tweet to us at Kodap Data Sci. Or questions can go to the Kodap Help Forum. Or the Kodap Help Forum. That's a wonderful, wonderful plug for that. Thank you, Bill. Um, lots of great interaction today. Thank you, everybody, for all your many questions on Zoom and Zoom chat. And I'm really grateful that we made such rich discussion happen. So we are going to send you a link to the recorded session shortly. Once I've finished compressing the video and getting it on YouTube, I'll send a link there. And if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to attend future data science education webinars, our next webinar series is going to be posted very shortly. I've started some Eventbrite links, which you'll see in your, um, in your email. And our next target date is in January. We have a few set of speakers coming up, including Aaron Barter and John De Niro, who both in January and February. You can sign up for future webinars at concord.org forward slash meetup, and you can stay connected with us on Twitter at CodeAppDataSci. If you use the hashtag DataSciEd to tweet us any additional questions or resource, we will respond to you, and we'll also look for questions in the CodeApp help forums. Please feel free to visit our website, codeapp.concord.org, to connect with us as well. Everybody, I had a wonderful time, and I look forward to seeing you all in January. Yeah, thanks, everybody.